This is episode 65. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello, Architect Nation. I am your host, Enoch Bartlett Sears. Now, just a quick note. Remember to get on the early notification list for the Business of Architecture conference. You need to be on the list to access the early bird discounted tickets. This is going to be the event this year for solo and small firm architects that want to run a more flexible, profitable firm and have fun doing it. Now, I've got a great lineup of top-notch speakers, but only those on the list will get first notice with all the deets. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash conference and get on the list. Today is the second part of my interview with Herbert Cannon. Herb Cannon is the president of the consulting uh, firm AEC Management Solutions. He's held senior positions at some of the nation's most prestigious firms, including Robert A.M. Stern Architects. He's a business powerhouse with a wealth of information on what works to create a business that is flexible, fun, and profitable, which, as you know, I love talking about here on the show. In addition, Herb also conducts seminars across the U.S., including one of his most popular seminars, The Pathway to Profit, Discover the Secrets of Earning 20% Plus Profit. So without further ado, here's the show. What are the top project management mistakes you generally see architecture firms making? I, well, you know, one, I still can't believe that people are not sharing, owners are not sharing project information with their project managers on the business side. They may, may not be sharing the fee, may not be sharing, you know, just not sharing the contract whatsoever. There's some sort of there's some sort of a voice in their head that says that the world's going to fall apart if they share financial information with their employees. So that's a big thing. We could talk a little bit more about that psych, about that psychology, but that, that's a that's a big problem. Number well, can two, we can we talk about that right now? Psychology of that? Um, yeah, we we could we could we could talk about that. I mean, they're so afraid that the employees are going to think that they're making so much money that they're going to ask for a raise. I really think I really think that's part of it. Yep. But what I tell them. Is there's such a lack of, of of understanding on the business side by by many of these people? Not all, but but are really more more than more than you would believe. They really just don't understand the business side whatsoever. I'll give you an example of what they think. When I started, um, well, let's let, let's say okay, I'm being paid twenty dollars an hour as someone. It's about forty thousand. I'm being paid twenty dollars an hour. They're billing me out at seventy five dollars an hour. What do you think a junior person like that thinks? They think, well, they're paying me twenty. They're pocketing well, five to ten dollars covers everything else, right? So thirty. So you know what? That herb, he's putting forty-five dollars an hour right in his pocket for every hour that I work. Mm-hmm. And you know, clearly we know that's not the case. But you know, if you ask them, if you ask them, they will come up with something similar to that. I guarantee it. So there's not even any education on, on, on that part. So I tell the owners, you know what, no matter what, what you show them, they think you're making a thousand times that. <laughs> okay. So the reality always, and, and generally what the reality of when they show them is when times are really, really bad. Mm. All of a sudden there's, there's, a, there's a willingness to share the information. Uh, with them, you know, we're going to build that. We're all, we're all in this together, um, sort of thing. So that, that that's interesting uh, psychologically. Um, or when I, you know, when I first started out, I did A, B, C, D, and E, and I, I don't understand why why they're not why they're not doing this. No, well, number one, if they were doing all those things, they would have their own firm. They wouldn't be working for you. All right. So part of you know a lot of what I do is really. Um, talking owners down off the ledge from unrealistic expectations of their employees. You know, if you have a hundred person firm and he, they're probably lucky if you can find two people that had all the attributes that the, that the owner has when, when, you know, yeah. when, 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 when he was young. So the psychology behind it, you know, I, I find it difficult to, to accept because I have never seen any harm done by sharing more information 
sharing billing rates. I always say, share everything except the salaries. Mm -hmm. You know, they already know what everyone else is making anyway, so it would be redundant, right? They all share, share their salary information. So share everything, share the contracts with them, have them write the proposals, have them do the budgets, have them decide, get them more involved and engaged because it, when you do, it, it creates much more of, of a team spirit. It creates that much more responsibility and accountability for making it happen. If they help negotiate the fee, if they put together the team, if they put together the scope of work, if they have access to the contract and the schedule and they get to meet the client, you know, these things can only help. Nothing bad can come of that. So number one is be open about the, mm -hmm. the contracts. I, I'm guessing that's so they can have a benchmark. There's no way to measure your progress unless you know what you have to work with. Absolutely. You know, I, I've had people tell me, you know, that I finished the project and then, you know, the first thing I hear is, well, you know, you were 20% over budget. And they go, what budget? <laughs> what budget? They, were never told, they were never told what target they were supposed to hit. What yeah. they were supposed to hit. And, you know, I say one thing about, you know, the younger people coming, coming out of school, and I, I think they're, they're really smart. Um, just like many of us were when we came out of school, they're just as eager to, to build their careers. And, you know, and I have three daughters. And, you know, as I noticed, you know, their education through um, certainly high school and, and, and college, everything seemed to be much more team oriented. When I went to school, you went there and you did your project, you did your homework, you took your test, and you were judged individually. There seemed to be a lot more teamwork involved, like team projects mm -hmm. and and so forth with, with certainly with my three daughters. And, you know, I think they kind of expect that. They enjoy being part of a team. So I think the more that we share with them, the more they feel like they're part of a team and the more they will help the owners, the managers of the firm accomplish their goals and succeed because they know where they're trying to go. Um, one of the things that I do is I call a, you know, a management audit or sometimes a human resources audit. And it's really just talking to the employees, interviewing the employees, doing an online survey. We multiple choice from something as a huge problem to it's no problem whatsoever. Or, and within each section, there's, there's a, a chance for them to say anything that they want, you know, about give us, give me at least two ideas to help us improve our marketing. Mm. And that's their opportunity. Or give me two more ideas to help us improve our financial performance or our project management or our design or our quality management. So at the end of each section, there's, an, there's, a, there's a chance for them to do that. Or, you know, what, what do you think the biggest problem here is? And interestingly enough, almost without a doubt, the thing that they're most dissatisfied with is communication. And I used to think that, and I'll be honest with you, when I first got out of school, you know, trained as an accountant, um, you know, communication, I, you know, I come to work, I do what I'm told, and I get my paycheck. You know, I don't really, I didn't really, it doesn't work anymore. That doesn't work, and that's certainly not the mindset of the more creative people. They want communication. And as, 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 as I slice and dice that information, you will find that the principals or partners, owners of the firm, they think there's great communication. They because they know everything that's going on, they think. And the further you go down on the food chain, the worse they think the communication is. And it's such a simple problem to solve. I don't, I don't know why everyone doesn't do it. And part of it is the sharing of the information. Yeah. Part of it is the sharing of the information of, of the current work. You know, how difficult is it to, for once a month, to, um, you know, if you have a large firm, you could do it over a webinar sort of thing to talk to everyone, you know, spend a half hour. We have a small firm, you get together and you talk. Hey, these are the marketing proposals we put out. We're hopeful, hopeful for this one. These are the two jobs we got in last month. Uh, this is the team. But and just give them an update and have a little open forum for them to ask questions. Creates a huge difference. Mm. Creates a huge difference for, for them. And uh, it makes them much less likely to, to leave your firm, uh, which is another problem we're facing now as the economy gets better. Um, because they feel like they're, you know, they're, they're part of their team and... To just keep going, there's one other, other, other thing that I like to talk about. We need to be careful when we're communicating what we say to the employees. You know, if, if you're an owner and you're 50 years old and, you have, and your two other partners are, are 50 years old and you come, up, come out to your 30-person firm and you tell them, you know, I'm working until I'm 85 
And we have 30 employees now, and we're never going to be more than 35. And what are the employees really hearing? The employees are really hearing is there's no place for me to go. Number one, I'm never going to be an owner because there's three owners already. They're going to work for the next 35 years. Number two, we're 30 people. They're only going to grow by five people. <laughs> there's nowhere for me to go. Yep. So I, in order for me to grow my career, I have to leave the firm. So we need to be careful, careful about what we say. Mm. And that's another thing. Owners always say, I never want to, I, my, my ambition isn't to grow the firm. I never wanted to be, uh, you know, I remember Bob Stern, Robert Stern, architects telling me, he goes, you know, Herb, I never thought we'd be a 140 person firm. And I heard, Herb, I never thought we'd be a 200 person firm. Herb, I never thought we'd be a 200, Herb, I never thought we'd be a 300 person firm. And they don't want to be, but I don't see anybody turning down work either to yep. remain small. So while, yep. You know, so there's kind of that inner conflict within them that they don't want to turn down work. They don't necessarily want to get bigger, but, you know, so they're conflicted. Mm. They're conflicted in, in, that, in that way. Um, just interesting, because I think growth is good. I think it creates opportunities for people. You can accomplish more uh, design-wise. You know, who's in a better position to create better design? A firm that's scraping by trying to cover payroll or a firm that's comfortably making a 20% plus profit, reinvesting it back in the company, being able to hire the best people, um, the best facilities, rewarding your people. It just, you know, creating the best websites, the best marketing materials to attract even more and better clients. Clearly the person with the money is in a much better position to do that. Bingo. I don't, I don't believe that the creativity is stifled by the money side. I think the money side and the creativity side go hand in hand. They complement each other. Herb, earlier you talked, about, you talked about firm valuation. Yes. And you mentioned, you, you inferred that there was a, a disjuncture between the reality of the situation and generally before people are in, informed, um, there's sort of a, a mismatch there of expectations. Is that what you see in that space, or I'd like to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I, 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 I do, you know, and there's, there's, two different, there's two different things of ownership transition and valuation. It's one thing if I'm the 100% owner and I want to bring in some, some other people to help me part, you know, to reward them, help me along, help grow the company. So I'm 100%, I'm willing to give up 25%, spread that amongst a couple of people without any real intention to ultimately transition the full ownership to them. You know, I want to keep them under my umbrella. And, you know, that's one, that's one valuation. The valuation under that scenario tends to be relatively low because, you know, it's not profit motivated in the short term. Um, you know, the other scenario is I'm retiring. I started this company from nothing um, and I want to get full value. And the real conflict is that the value that I can get for selling it to the outside versus the value that I can get transitioning it internally is a big gap there. In which direction? If selling to the outside, you'll generally always get more. Because number one, they, you know, the employees that have been with you, all they've ever gotten was a salary. Where are they going to get the money to buy more, a market value company design firm that's well run it, it just it's just difficult it hasn't been done of course it's been done but it's just much much more difficult mm. um and on the other hand so some some owners are willing to transfer ownership even on retirement as low as book value you know the net equity in the firm you know i'll be happy to transfer it at that um because they've re provided for the retirement um outside of the value they've created in in, in the company on the other hand, if they haven't provided for their retirement, out, you know, taking the money out, provided outside of there in the stock market or real estate, whatever their investments are, and their their business is the biggest investment, then they have a dilemma. Then they are almost forced to sell to the outside. So there's a lot of conflicts that that they, that go on there, um, and you know the internal transition. I, I easily talk for three hours about this. At the uh, at, at my seminar, like I go, we'll probably talk for six. There's just so many things that 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 go, that go into it. You know, owners tend to have an unrealistic expectation about the time frame. 
If you're going to transition internally, you know, you need to do it over maybe like seven to 10 years to, to able for the employees to be able to, to buy you out just because of, of cash flow issues. Mm -hmm. um, if you're selling externally, it's un they're unrealistic even then about what they could expect to receive in value for their company. Um, you know, people, I mean, I've, run, I've run across recently so where some people are disadvantaged business enterprises or is it either it's a WBE or a minority status. And it makes it even that much more difficult to transfer because, you know, your, your contracts may not necessarily be transferable. Um, working with one firm that does work for a, a, a school district. And even if you sell 100 percent of your company to a stock, the, the, to, you know, to another individual, the contract isn't even transferable. You know, the practicality of that, I don't know. You know, they yep. probably transfer it anyway. But you have all of these other issues that that that, that just come up. I one one firm that I was working with here in New Jersey got a number of uh, probably eight about eight years ago. It started out as an internal transition, and as I you know part of the process I go through is education. We're educating the owners. We're educating the, the new staff that's coming in to be partners. And there was three people that this individual wanted to transfer ownership to, and he didn't want to retire. And as I sat down with individual interviews, one person said, well, you know, Herb, I'm going through a divorce. It just, I, I just can't do it. You know, it's just not practical financially for me to be able to do it and mentally and all these other things. Okay, understood. We still love you. We want you to stay here. Talk to the other person. He goes, Herb, no one else knows this, but... I never really had to work. I have a really big trust fund. <laughs> I'm thinking about going and doing some more philanthropic work anyway. So, you know, so it ultimately, so from there it becomes an external sale, which happens, you know, maybe 20% of the time. We, you know, we try to go through that internal transition for whatever reason, people don't want to take on the risk. They don't understand the business side. You know, they haven't been trained on that. You know, we show them a balance sheet. So you see a balance sheet and you see, okay, cash, we have 250000 accounts receivable, we have 700000 okay, so we have 950000 almost a million dollars, let's call it, of current assets. And they look and they look at the liability side and they say, oh, there's consultants payable, 250000 other trade things, it's like 100000 350000 you this firm owes three hundred and fifty thousand. This owner wants me to come in and buy this company with three hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of debt, and you know, and coming from their background and experience, that's exactly what they see. They don't, they can't put it together in the short term anyway. That gee, you know, there's a million dollars here. Yeah, we owe three fifty. The net is, you know, six fifty to seven hundred thousand. So that's a challenge too. So you you know, you never really know. Until uh, until you go through it, some employees are so offended that they would be asked to pay anything. Really? <clears throat> absolutely, absolutely. That well, what I've I've been here for eighteen years. Why should I have to pay to be pay money to be a partner? Uh, because it has a value, and we're not giving it away for the last eighteen years. You know, the company's provided you with a salary and benefits and. All these other things that go with it, and it's it's not a re, it's the reward for that service is being asked to be a partner. The reward isn't to give it to give it to someone. So you know, there's a lot of education in, in, in that. On the other hand, some people are just really ready and eager to do it. While we're on we're on on that subject, you know, how, you know, how do we choose the owners of a company? Big thing. Um, you know, it's probably you know, if the the smaller the firm. The more the number of criteria there is, there should there generally is for being an owner. So if you have a 10, 12 person firm and I want a partner, well, you better be able to you better be technically good, have good design skills, you better be able to bring in business, you better be able to manage people, you you know, and you just can, can go down go down the list. Um, you know, if you're a larger firm, if you have 150 people, you can afford to have someone as a smaller partner who's a specialist. Yeah, you know what? They're never going to market. Uh, they really can't manage people, but they're a really great designer. Okay. Well, you know, we can afford to have that person. So the criteria is different. And yeah. they say, well, you know, what, what's, what's the checklist of the 10 
things that we, we need to look for before you can become an owner. And I say, well, there may be a checklist, but the last thing that you want to do is publish that checklist. You don't want to put it out there and say, you know, if you're an employee and you do these 10 things, then you're going to be an owner. Because I guarantee you, the person that you least want to be an owner in your firm will accomplish that list. And they'll come to you with a check for their fortune. <laughs> but you, 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 hardly can, you can hardly bear being with them as an employee. All right? So you don't want to publish them. You have that mental list um, of, 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 what, of what it is. But don't, don't, don't publish it, whatever, whatever you do. Excellent. What, what, you know, a large part of our audience, we do have people from different firm sizes listening into the, the yeah. show. A lot of the yeah. audience, they do belong to smaller firms or they own smaller firms. We have a lot of sole practitioners mm -hmm. who are practicing now. You know, what tips do you have for being successful as a sole practitioner? Maybe the top two or three things that you think generally sole practitioners need to be focusing on to be competitive and, and have the good kind of life they're wanting to have. Yeah, this, you know, I, I think you need to have a have a really good work process, uh, and you know, you have a small firm. You need to hire good people. Mm -hmm. There's no room. For, there's no room for dead wood mm -hmm. in a small firm. If you have a larger firm, you, you know, people can fly under the radar. But if you have a ten person firm, you know, everybody better be pulling their pulling their weight plus. So I think it's really really important. And I, I think you need if there's personnel issues, you need to deal with them. And deal with them. Deal with them quickly, because you know a cancer in a small in a small firm can spread spread very very quickly. Um, understand the you know the, the the business fundamentals. What are the key drivers of um, of the business? You know, understand the you know the net multiplier, the overhead rate. Um, utilization rate, you know, the really the the three the three big things there, and you know, share those concepts with your employees on a, on a regular basis. Set set benchmarks for them, and track in a general way. That's a way of when we talk about ratios and benchmarks like that. That's a way of sharing high level information without sharing the actual dollars that are involved with, with profit and, and so forth. So I think that that's important. And, you know, make everyone, make everyone in your firm a business person and aware of what those key, th of what those key things are, what their expert expectations are on utilization, what a net multiplier means. Um, and it's, you know, most of your success comes from the basics. There's yeah. no, no question about it, you know, and a lot of firms, they don't take the, the really very, very short time it takes to master those base basics. And if you master those basics, you're 80% of the way there easily. Master the basics, everything else is that, it's that incremental 20% past it. That's much, much more difficult to do. But you master the basics, which you can get a basic understanding of those within, by spending a day at a seminar, mine, <laughs> um, where, you, where you really get to, to understand those basics. And it takes a little bit longer to put them into, put them into place and really understand how to optimize them. But um, it's an investment that, that, really, that really does pay, does pay dividends. How can people connect with you, Herb, and find out more about what you do? Um, they can connect with me on my, my website, aecmanagementsolutions.com. Um, they can send me an email, uh, hcannon at aecmanagementsolutions.com. Notice how I have the nice short uh, website URL for people to go to. <laughs> uh, they can do that. Hey, okay, pick up the phone. Give me a call, 732-705-5098. My business number. I'd be happy to, uh, to take your call, answer some questions. And um, I found this immensely enjoyable. Are we wrapping this up now, you know? As did I. Yeah, I wanted to ask you if you had anything else that you felt like you wanted to, to talk about or mention before we cut it off. No, I, I just, you know, I, I want to really thank you for this opportunity. I think it's a great thing that, that, you're, that you're doing here. Um, I've had the opportunity to see some of the videos that you're producing and, um, you know, good work. I, I enjoy it, and I think uh, I'm honored that you asked me to participate in, the, in this. And uh, if I have the opportunity again, I would love to do it. 
And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use Internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.